Good evening. So we'll get started shortly. I'm Madhu Khanna. I'm the Associate Director for Education and Outreach at the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment that's hosting this uh, second Congress this year uh, focused on water. Uh, we're really pleased that uh, you could all join us, and we're looking forward to two, two productive days of intense presentations and conversations. Uh, just a few organizational things before we get started. Um, we're, in order to uh, reduce the paper use for printing programs, we are trying uh, a new approach, which is to have this app that you can download on your phones, and the instructions for that are up on the screen. So you should be able to get the complete program with the information about the speakers and the bios and so on from there. Um, we are um, also going to be trying a, uh, some new approaches to facilitate um, question and answers with the speakers. And so uh, in addition to the microphones that are up here and that you're welcome to use at the end of the talk, um, there are also index cards that you can use to write down your question and pass them at the end for the speaker to address uh, as well. And then for those of you who are on Twitter, uh, you can use that to uh, send your comments. There is a hashtag up there, and we will convey those questions to the speaker as well. So we'll see how that works. Send us your feedback on, on how you find this uh, for, future, uh, for future use. Uh, at the end of this, there is a reception, uh, so please stay on and join the speakers and the other participants. There are posters on display and the poster presenters will be here, uh, and so uh, we'd love to have you continue to stay on and, and uh, interact uh, with, with the speakers that are here. So with that, we're going to get started, um, and I'm going to invite uh, Evan DeLucia, who is the director of the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment, to give his welcome remarks and introduce our speaker. A Twitter account. I have one now. See, we all have to have those. Let me start by reminding you to avoid embarrassment. I always put it to vibrate mode. Um, well, well, welcome and good evening. I'm Evan DeLucia. I'm director of the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment here at the University of Illinois. And I want to welcome you to the opening event for our IC Congress 2015. Water Planet Water Crisis, Meeting the World's Water, Food, Energy Needs Sustainably. Professor Robert Glennon will be, not, will be kicking things off with what is sure to be a stimulating and provocative keynote speech. Uh, but first, I want to give a little preview into what, I, what it is I think this, this uh, Congress will uh, accomplish in the next few days. This is our, our second Congress. Uh, IC hosts an annual Congress focusing on a different sustainability-related issue, uh, tackling a grand, uh, grand world challenge each year. <laughs> this year, we're tackling the most basic human need, water. Water is an integral part of our lives. We drink it, we eat it, not only in fresh foods, but as an ingredient in the processed food systems we use. We boil it to produce steam to create electricity. We use it to force fossil fuels out of the ground, we grow cotton with it to make our jeans and clothing with. It's in everything in our homes. Changing the way we use water in one of these areas will surely and undoubtedly impact the way we use it in all other areas. We called this Congress Water Planet Water Crisis because even though the Earth is bathed in water, when it's mismanaged, it creates disaster. Demand for fresh, clean water is increasing across the globe as our population rises. Human actions are being intensified by climate change and altering when, where, and how water is available. This in turn affects agriculture, the energy industry, and ecosystems, both natural and agricultural alike. During this Congress, we will talk about the causes and consequences of the water crisis for the United States and overseas. We need to have a discussion about how governments, industry, and science can inform the way we use our most precious resource on Earth more sustainably. And so to start us thinking about the American water crisis, we have with us this evening Professor Robert Glennon. He is Regents Professor and Morris K. Udall Professor of Law and Public Policy at the James E. Rob Roger Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona. During his 40-year career, he has studied and taught constitutional law, water policy, and the restoration and maintenance of ecosystems in our arid lands. 
He holds a Juris Doctor degree from Boston College Law School and Master's and PhD degrees uh, in American History from Brandeis University. He is a member of the bars in both Arizona and Massachusetts. Professor Glennon has advised local, state, and national governments providing them the knowledge they need to solve serious challenges of water sustainability and planning. In 2008 and 2009, he served as a member of the team to draft water law for Saudi Arabia, and he currently acts as a water policy advisor to Pima County, Arizona, home of the city of Tucson and the University of Arizona. He may be best known for his book, Unquenchable, America's Water Crisis and What to Do About It, which received a Rachel Carson Book Award for reporting on the environment from the Society of Environmental Journalists. He is also author of the book, Water Follies, Groundwater Pumping and the Fate of America's Fresh Water, which was praised by the New York Times and Scientific American. In all of his work, Professor Glennon argues that we cannot engineer our way out of this problem with the usual fixes or even some rather creative and desperate schemes. America must make hard choices and Professor Glennon is here to share with us the answers as he sees it. Please join me in welcoming Professor Glennon to our Congress. Uh, now I'm in trouble because I have no idea how to get the Prezi up on the screen, so if there's someone in the back who can, can help us on that, that would be great. Uh, good afternoon, all. Good to, good to see you. And it's good to be back in Champaign. Uh, I started teaching 40 years ago, and uh, shortly after I started, I was invited to come down here and spend a semester as a visiting professor at the law school, and it was, a, it was one of the high points of my career. I loved it here. Uh, I remember the, uh, the, the, the bike lanes, kind of like interstate highways, where you could pass each other on one side. It's grown some since. Uh, I'm over at the I Hotel. That was sort of way on the outskirts. It was just a golf course way back then. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, uh, really a pleasure to be with you. That looks like it's going to get really close to where I want to be. OK. Um, there's a third thing that I've done. The most recent thing is a report for the Brookings Institution last fall called Shopping for Water. Uh, that's available uh, for free downloading on the, the Brookings Institution website or my publisher, for those of you who do Kindle, Island Press brought it out as an ebook for free downloading on, on, uh, on uh, Amazon if, you, if you're so inclined. So what are we going to do this evening? Well, first, uh, I'm going to say a word or two about the global water crisis just to frame the issue. Um, but th these are some staggering and scary statistics. More than a billion people lack access to, to, to good water. And for two and a half billion people, they don't have adequate sanitation. And can you believe that to this day, in 2015, people are still dying of waterborne diseases, diarrheal d diseases? Millions of people. This is, this is uh, something you think should be something that we cured a very, very long time ago. And it's not just a human health issue, though that's enough to make us sit up and, and take pause and, and be concerned. It's also an, an enormous economic one. Because if you think about it, virtually every company needs water. For example, National Hockey League teams last year used more than 300 million gallons of water to run their stadiums. I had never thought about hockey teams being a big water consumer. And so while we have fretted in the United States about running out of oil, water lubricates the American economy and the global economy uh, just as, as oil does. So a couple things tonight. The crisis, well, I'm going to show a few slides on that. Uh, make a couple comments about the challenges facing both farmers and food processors. And I want to talk both about some new things we might be doing, but also some of the, 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 the traditional ways of doing things that I think are, are just not going to get the job done. We need to be far more innovative than we have been in the past. So first, uh, one of the great and iconic Western writers, Ed, Ed Abbey, an Arizona, said that there's plenty of water in the Mojave Desert unless you should try to establish a city where no city should be. Well, that, of course, would be the, the city of Las Vegas. And here we have the iconic Bellagio Fountain. How many of you have been to Las Vegas? OK, show of hands. How many of you love this fountain? How many of you hate this fountain? There's nothing neutral about Las Vegas. You know, you're on, we're on one side of the, or the other. So this fountain cost $40 million. This fountain 
holds 27 million gallons of water. This fountain has an eight acre footprint. It has 250 heads that shoot water as high as 250 feet into the desert sky. And yet that, that's only the beginning of how Las Vegas uses water. How many of you are familiar with City Center? Only a couple. Uh, it's the largest privately financed construction project in American history, penciled in at a little over $9 billion. It's got six towers, ranging in size from, from 37 to 61 stories. And to give you a sense of scale, see that, that, that dark structure on the left there? That's the Monte Carlo Casino. It's one of the largest casinos in the Strip, and yet it looks like a child's toy compared to these other things going on around it. At Build Out, there are going to be 50,000 new people living in the Las Vegas Strip. And people coming all over the US, from Canada, from the EU, from the Pacific Rim, dying to buy condos on the Strip. And the funny thing is, it's not about gaming. In this entire complex, there's only one casino. Instead, it's about the other things that Las Vegas offers as it has once again remade itself. It's about the club scene and the fine dining and the shopping and the boutiques and the shows. That's what people are going to Las Vegas for. But there is a problem. And it's a big, they've literally run out of water. And the head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority until a few months ago, Patricia Mulroy, was a little late dealing with this problem. But suddenly she had a conversion. And like many people who, who, who join a religion, she was fervent and passionate about water conservation. And she really transformed the city of Las Vegas. She began by paying people to rip out lawns, $2 per square foot. And they spent more than $200 million, million dollars ripping out lawns. Then she offered to build the cities of Tijuana and San Diego desalination, desalination plants located on the Pacific Ocean. She, in turn, take their Colorado River water out of Lake Mead. And the third thing she did was she embarked on building a $3 billion, that's with a B, billion dollar pipeline to import groundwater from 250 feet north of Las Vegas. Now, the place where she wanted to do this was located on the border with Utah. And the people up there didn't think this was such a good idea, Las Vegas coming after their water. And if you think about your American history, you realize that the people who settled that border between Utah and Nevada were some of the original pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But from my perspective, a lawyer who, who finds fights over water endlessly fascinating, uh, nothing could be better than a fight over water that pitted Sin City against the Mormons. <laughs> So there's one other thing she's done to try to persuade people in Las Vegas to save water, and that's she's been running public service announcements on local television. See if this would play uh, in, in your hometown. Oops. Yeah, we got it. That's going to not be quite right. Let's go back. your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com. Las Vegas has a different sense about what's appropriate for television than some Midwestern towns, I suppose. Uh, okay, well, but let me get this straight. Uh, so she's threatening you with bodily harm. She's trying to steal the Mormon's water. But how could she possibly justify the strip, the casino, the Bellagio Fountain, the lagoons, the pi pi pirate ships, the Venetian Canal? Well, actually, pretty, pretty easily. Because when Steve Wynn, the developer of, of, the, of the, the Bellagio, came to her, he said, listen, this is my idea, a water feature. I've got to have a water feature. So let me do that, and I'll do whatever else you want. And she said, really, Steve? OK, this is what I want. I want you to treat that contaminated water in, that's beneath the casino and reuse it. 
I want you to build a reverse osmosis plant. I want you to install low flow fixtures and instant on hot water. And she had a very, very long list. And you know what? He did it. And they all do it. That fountain, it's all recycled water. The strip, wasting water, the strip uses 3% of Las Vegas' water. And yet they are the economic driver in the state second to none. In Nevada, as every western state, farmers use most of the water, about 80%. In Nevada, that produces a farm economy that supports about 6,000 jobs. 6,000 jobs is about the same number of jobs as one casino supports. So if you start to think about the economic value of water, you realize what a gold mine they have with these casinos. And you realize what they're doing is playing to the economic strength of the tourism industry with a fairly modest amount of water. And so I start tonight with Las Vegas, because despite the fact that they have the slogan about what happens there stays there, when you turn to water, nothing could be further from the truth. This is the future of water. The present of water could be summed up by uh, uh, one of our wisest founding fathers' remarks, Ben Franklin. When the well's dry, we know the worth of water. There's a problem, though. He was wrong. We don't know the worth of water. We Americans are spoiled. We wake up in the morning and we turn on that tap, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. When most of us think about water, if we do at all, we think of it as though it were the air, infinite and inexhaustible, when for all practical purposes it's very finite and very exhaustible. And so I have this simple-minded notion that water is like a giant milkshake glass. And what we've been doing is allowing straw after straw to be inserted into the glass. So the crisis. Um, this is the, uh, the map from about a week ago, put out by the University of Nebraska, the drought monitor map. Oh boy, if you haven't been west lately, it is really rugged. And these, these fires that are raging now, they're gonna, they're gonna come back and haunt people for years, because. When there finally is a storm, there's nothing to hold it back. There are going to be mudslides, the rivers are going to get hammered, uh, the water supply is going to be compromised, both in quality and quantity. It's, it's just terrible. And, you know, now, six months ago, Texas would have looked as red, but they got a 20-inch storm in, in, in June and July. Three years ago, the whole Midwest, right? You were here. The whole Midwest would have been just about as red. Not quite as deep red, but pretty down, darn, uh, darn uh, ugly. Uh, last year, two years ago, in, in Cargill, uh, or rather in, in Plainview, Texas, uh, the Cargill Corporation closed a meatpacking plant. So a business went out, of, uh, a company went out of business. Oh, but wait a minute. This company employed 2,200 people. The entire population of the town was 23,000. This town is destroyed. All the good jobs are gone. It was one company town, and it's absolutely been destroyed. Um, a photograph from earlier this year of the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. Now, if by earlier this year I meant last month, it wouldn't be a problem. But I don't. This is a photograph from January at 8,000 feet. You're not supposed to see bare ground in the high Sierra in January. It should be as high as floor to ceiling in some, in some parts on, on a typical year. That's a four-year drought. The Colorado itself is in much worse shape. We're in the middle of a 15-year drought. The river is over-allocated. Shortages to, to Arizona and Nevada could come as early as next year. And what is scary is we don't know whether this 15th year drought is the last of a 15-year drought or the beginning part of a 50-year drought. And so it makes it very difficult for water managers to figure out what are they supposed to do going forward. Particularly, this is raising problems for farmers. Um, it's a simple one. I'm not going to dwell on this. We're going to hear some very creative stuff over the next two days about uh, new kinds of plants and the like. But, but let me just touch on a couple of themes. One, the obvious, uh, the elephant in the room is population growth. We're going to go from 7 billion to 9 billion by, by 2050. Uh, I mean, gosh, that's in, the, that's in the lifetime of most people in this room. Uh, at least some of the people. <laughs> so population growth is a 
big, big problem. Uh, 2014 was the hottest year on record. Uh, the, the old record only lasted three years. Is it climate change? You know, the scientists aren't going to say any particular year looks bad. But if you look at this slide, the, 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 the reality global wide is just overwhelming, all of those different indices. And what this creates is really a double whammy because as the temperature goes up, there'll be changes in precipitation patterns. But there's still going to be as much rain, but it's not going to be in the same places. And the American West is in the eye of the storm. All of the climate, most of the climate people are saying there's going to be a lot less water. A lot less water and it's going to take a lot more water to grow the same amount of food because there's so much more evaporation loss among other reasons. So farmers and food processors are facing a real storm. And they're not getting any love. I mean, no love at all. They're being attacked. If I read once more that it takes a gallon of water to grow an almond, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow a dog and kick it. So, I mean, this is just, you know, enough. It takes 158 gallons to grow a watermelon. I mean, it takes a lot of water to grow anything. And so what's the proposal? The proposal is we should tell farmers what to grow and regulate what they grow. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't the Soviet Union try that in the 1950s? Planned economy? Is that really what the LA Times is editorializing in 2015? Oh, God save us. So it's a tough time to be a farmer. Well, it's really all about supply and demand, right? And there are some very indulgent demands for water. My favorite is this one. This is Kohler's power shower. It has 10 shower heads helping her get clean, each with enough water pressure to take paint off walls. <laughs> And then there's bottled water. I was the first to blow the whistle on that in, in my book, Water Follies. I won't, the litany, you, you get it now. But this is Jennifer Aniston pimping for Glasso smart water. Instead, I will, I will tell you this. If you have not seen the Penn and Teller skit about bottled water, check it out on YouTube. It's from their Showtime ca uh, cable show. So it shows fancy California restaurant. But instead of a wine steward, there's a water steward, complete with the apron over his arm, and the, the water list wrapped in the wine list. And he's advising the patrons on different brands of bottled water to purchase. And then he pours, the, pours it into the glass, and they swirl it around like a nice French wine, sniff it, you know, sniff water, sniff it, and then say, definitely glacial, you know, definitely glacial. And then the clip goes to the next segment, and Penn is out in the backyard with a garden hose filling all these bottles of water. So there are some indulgent uses of water, but there are also some very new demands and high value demands, and energy is one of them. Now, I don't have a dog in the fight on ethanol, whether the return on investment is positive or negative. But what, I, what totally amazes me as a water guy is how US energy policy has developed in utter disregard of the water implications of various types of energy. And so, for me, this really does put ethanol in the bullseye, because even if you have a modern plant that recycles its water, it still takes as much as four gallons of water to produce one gallon of ethanol. Now, that's a lot of water, but, you know, we can deal with that. The real problem is growing the corn. Now, that's not a problem if you're in the Midwest, where until recently it was all dry land farming. Uh, we'll come back to the new rush to drill groundwater wells here uh, in, in a few minutes. But if it's just rain that you're taking out of the sky to grow it, no big deal. But once you go west of the 100th meridian, of course, it's all irrigation. And it may take as much as 2,500 gallons of water to grow enough corn to refine one gallon of ethanol. Well, now you do the math, 2,500 times four times the billions that Congress says we should produce, you're talking about an enormous demand for water, for just, just for uh, ethanol. Uh, the, the more recent uh, focus has been on fracking, and I saw there was at least one poster outside, very interesting poster you want to check out about uh, fracking water. Fracking's been around for a long time, of course. What's new is this directional drilling. That just 
You know, I just can't get my hands around that. Okay, you send the thing down 10,000 feet, and then you take, tell it to take a left. And it does, and it drills holes two, two miles down by just going left. Yeah, you know, that's what it does. Um, the problem with, F, with fracking is not that each well uses so much. It's five million gallons. It's a lot of water, but in the bigger picture, not such a big deal. But it's where it's occurring. Most good places to frack are already places that are under water stress. So you're starting to see a conflict, again, between another kind of energy and, um, and water. But maybe scariest of all during this drought now is the decline in hydropower production. Because as the reservoirs, Mead, Powell, and others in the West go down, there's not the same lift. You get less energy produced, and you don't have as much water to run the turbines anyway. So it's, uh, it's really quite problematic. And then if you think about you've got to replace that energy with something, what are you going to use? Well, it's mostly going to be fossil fuel energy, uh, produce, energy produced by fossil fuels, reinforcing the, the energy, water, and climate change aspect um, to it. Um, energy, and uh, we have a limitless demand for energy. This company uses a ton of it. Uh, you'd never know what company that was by looking at the, that building, but that's Google. Google needs a lot of water because that's what's inside the Google building. It's what, he, what Google calls a server farm. It could have been Facebook, it could have been Amazon, it's data centers. I mean, you millennials have a, an infinite desire to be on all the time, right? I mean, what are the Kardashians tweeting? And the adults in the room, I mean, if I see one more picture of your cat on YouTube, it's not that interesting. And people are uploading to YouTube 100 hours of video every minute. Oh, save us. Maybe that's more indulgent than the 10 shower heads. I would think. In any event, it's a demand that now drives the economy. Because while we're having fun on, on, on social media and, and talking with our friends, all these companies are doing business, and they want 6 nines reliability. So the fact that there's some energy wasted along the way, it doesn't matter. The first time someone clicks to your site and, they don't, and it doesn't load up right away is the first time you've lost a, a client, a, a customer, and you are not a happy camper. Okay, so pretty bleak. Supply and demand out of whack. New threats to it in the form of global warming, population increase. What are we going to do about it? So my message tonight is we can do something about it. Quite a few things. No one thing but a series of things, a menu or portfolio, perhaps, is the right approach. But there are also some, some ideas, I think, that just uh, shouldn't have any traction uh, whatsoever. So this is a billboard uh, from the state of Michigan, where I taught. I taught at Wayne State at the beginning of my career. Um, and this shows what people in the Midwest think about those of us in the Southwest. And I just I put this up to just say, this is a horrible billboard. This is a scurrilous attack on those of us in the, in the Southwest, really. The idea that we want to divert all of the Great Lakes? Pfft. Frankly, we'd be happy with one of the smaller ones. <laughs> um, there are people with such idiotic ideas. Here's a guy out of Colorado, Aaron Millian. He wants, he wants to, to build a pipeline that will take water from Flaming Gorge Reservoir, bring it along the I-80 corridor, all the way past Laramie and Cheyenne, Denver, and all the way down to Colorado Springs. Now, time won't permit me to talk about all of the obstacles that Mr. Million faces before he brings this into, into production. I will mention one, and that's something called the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> um, so what, what do we normally do when we don't have enough water in the United States? Well, we do three things. We divert more water from rivers. And we are really good at that. I mean, really good. So good that a lot of rivers have died. They're dry. And I don't mean just piddling little creeks. I'm talking about the Rio Grande and the Colorado River. Those rivers don't even reach the ocean. They're dead. So the idea that we're going to get more water out of rivers, I think, is probably not sensible and certainly isn't uh, being very aware of the environmental and ecological implications. Building dams, we're good at that, too. Look at all those dams. 
we, if, we have agencies, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers, their entire job is if water moves, stop it. So we're good at keeping water in its place behind a dam. But we're so good that there really aren't any good dam sites left. And you know as well as I that the direction for dam building in the United States is the other way around. We're taking dams out, we're not building them. From the Edwards in Maine to the, to, to the Klamath and, and to, to other dams in, in, in Washington State, where we're moving them and we're restoring thousands of miles of free-flowing rivers. So I don't think we're going to solve our problem either by more diversions or by more dams. Now, what about groundwater? Well, unfortunately, that remains the open septic. And groundwater pumping is having terrible environmental consequences. That's where we come back to the milkshake class. Because what uh, many states, including most in the Midwest, permit is anyone who wants can drill a well, no questions asked, and pump away with impunity. This photograph is a classic one, those of you uh, in hydrology know it well. It's a USGS slide from the 70s. And you can see the surface of the earth literally dropped from the year 1925 to the year 1977. Literally dropped in San, in San Joaquin Valley. Well, that's going on right now. As we sit here in 2015, California still has no regulation over groundwater. Full stop. No regulation over groundwater in most of the basins in the entire state. Anyone who wants can just drill a well and pump. Well, that's not, that's, that's the equivalent of a circular firing squad. Everyone aiming in until you finally exhaust the supply. It's the, it's the tragedy of the commons in capital letters. So I don't think that's going to get the job done. But that's what's going on in California. Okay. So my message is pretty straightforward. More diversions, more dams, more wells is not going to get the job done. These huge trans-basin interstate diversions, that era was interesting, but that era is over. So what can we do to solve the water crisis? Well, one of the things people think about is changing the weather, weather modification uh, or cloud seeding. So you put a little silver iodide in this machine and shoot it up in the air and, and you hope it, hope it, it, it rains. Uh, the National Research Council, though, took a very hard look at six decades of of weather modification, and they found that there's no convincing scientific evidence that it will work. But it's still being done all around the West. I mean, people will spend all kinds of money hoping, praying that something will happen, rather than looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, you know, maybe, maybe we have to change something and not simply assume there's some new support out there. But I just ask you, do you want to trust your water supply to these two guys? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, if, if weather modification won't work, what about desalting the ocean? Actually, that will work. Absolutely will work. We have the technology to do it. The Israelis maybe show, showed the way, but uh, there's a lot of people who can take salt out of water. So it will be part of the portfolio, but it won't be the silver bullet. For one thing, it's enormously expensive. The filters for reverse osmosis are high-tech, costly, prone to, prone to fouling, and they require frequent replacement. So that's one problem. Second problem is it's a huge energy sink because it's all done under high pressure. So it takes a lot of energy reinforcing the energy water connection. And the third thing is you have an environmental problem with what do you do with the salt that's left over because it doesn't go away. It just concentrates it. So you have to get rid of that somehow, and that's not such an easy task. Uh, you've perhaps seen some reports about a Poseidon desal plant in San Diego County that has been uh, underway for a while. Let me tell you just briefly about it to give you a sense of what really is happening in the desal world. This was a plant that was first proposed for permitting in 1998. It is still not operating with luck it will operate next year. So that's 18 years from proposal to, to uh, launch. The costs have now escalated to over a billion dollars. And this is what they are going to do. They are going to divert 300 million gallons of water a day.
they are going to treat 100 million. In treating the 100 million, they will get 50 million potable and 50 million with 100% of the salt from the 100. And then they are going to take that 100, mix it with the 200 they've saved, and put it someplace. So if this sounds just a tad like Rube Goldberg, then you and I are thinking along the same lines. We can do it, but it's not easy, and it won't be the world's salvation. It is incredibly costly and energy challenging. Still, if you've got high value use, a few other options, desal will be an important part um, going forward. Reuse. Reuse has got to be a big part going forward. Now, it's had a bad name. It's called the toilet to tap proposal and all the stuff about the golden retriever. So I'm, I'm not here tonight to tell you that you should nudge Fido out of the way. You know, that's, that's not what we're doing this evening. What I am here to tell you is that water that's been treated is way too valuable not to reuse again. Uh, in Tucson, we use reuse water for golf courses, parks, cemeteries, highway medians, starting to use it some for, for um, light industrial applications. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, Google is starting to use uh, some reclaimed water in some of its server farms. There's much more we can do. And to give you a sense of the lunacy of water in the United States, and especially in California, uh, LA has a treatment plant called the Hyperion Treatment Plant. It produces a volume of water equal to the seventh seventh largest river in the United States. And virtually every drop of that water, they dump into the Pacific Ocean. Really? Really? We can do better. We must do better. So reuse will be an important issue going forward. So is conservation. This is a photo from Damon Winter of the New York Times a few months ago. And it really says so much about Southern California, about a constructed environment. I mean, LA and San Diego get 12 or 13 inches of rain a year. We in Tucson, in the middle of this northern desert, get 11 to 12, an inch less. We drive around Tucson in vain looking for a lawn. But in Southern California, everyone's got a lawn, everyone's got a pool, and the right side shows you what the real landscape was like. If they simply took a look, at pools and lawns, they would go a long way toward solving their water problem. And in fact, that is happening right now. They are taking a page out of the last playbook, and there are lots of pools that are being uh, filled in and uh, lawns that are being ripped out in Southern California. Now, they're such a narcissistical bunch. Will they have the staying power after a couple of months? How many of you think yes? I didn't think anyone would think yes. So, so, uh, so conservation is a big part going forward. Let me give you two examples. Your kitchen food disposal. If you use that two minutes a day, by the end of the month, you will have used 150 gallons of water. Just to get rid of food scraps. Really. Well, put them in the trash or put them in your compost bin. Don't use your kitchen sink and potable water to get rid of food scraps. The second thing, lights. If you want to save water, turn off a light. A single 60 watt incandescent bulb that burns 12 hour a day may at the end of the year use as much as 6,300 gallons of water. One light, 60 watts. So there are things we can do to save water in a very, very meaningful way. Uh, water harvesting. Uh, is really taking off. Green infrastructure is taking off. Uh, at the I Hotel, where, where, where you folks are putting me up, there's a, there's a green roof. I mean, I looked out the head of the, the roof of the conference uh, center there has, has a green roof on it. So it's very interesting. This particular photo is from San Juan Island off of Seattle. Uh, the, the people had a groundwater well that was going saline. They put in this system. It collects rainwater off the roof. They, they store it in this, in this uh, cistern. They treat it, they're off the water grid. Off the water grid. So just taking water out of the rain, uh, rain water can go a long way toward uh, helping some communities. Okay, so if you're still with me, I think this is where we are. I think 
Conservation is important. I think reuse is important. I think desalinization will play a part. But now, in, in the, the time I have remaining, I'd like to talk about three things we're not doing that I think we should be doing in the United States. First, I would take dead aim the American toilet. What a bizarre institution. Yeah, I know the history in the 19th century was better than, than, than outdoor um, privy vaults and the like, yeah, but it has way uh, survived long past its time. Because if you, if you think about it, it wastes water, wastes money, wastes energy. A century ago, Teddy Roosevelt said, civilized people shouldn't put sewage in the drinking water. Well, of course. Well, a century later, that's, of course, exactly what we do do. And the toilet is the example of how we do it. We get delivered potable water. Of that, we only use 10% for cooking and drinking. Fully a third we use outdoors for landscaping. Of indoor use, fully a third of that we just flush away. That's six billion gallons of water a day, two trillion gallons of water a year, just to get rid of human waste. We can do better. You scientists can do better. Already, there are uh, waterless urinals and composting toilets. Whether the toilets are ready for prime time, perhaps not. But we have the, the ability and the engineering know-how to do a better job. We must, we really must look at how we get rid of human waste. So that's first. Second, price. You've got to pay for water. It's about time. Water's just too darn cheap. In fact, in fact, you don't pay for water at all. Really? Really? Well, well, I just wrote a check to the water department or the public utility regulated by the state public utility commission. Yeah, I know you did. But you didn't do that for water. The rate structure is based to be revenue neutral. All they're collecting from you is their costs in providing you the water. The plumbers and the treatment system and the pipes and all that, that's it's charging you for those sunk costs. You are not paying for the water. And that's why water is so cheap. And we're, you're only paying typically the old cost. You're not paying marginal cost. You're not paying the cost of new supplies. It's a truly bizarre pricing scheme. And in some places, there's no charge whatsoever. Would you believe that the capital of California, Sacramento, has fought having water meters in homes? And as we sit here this evening, still, Sacramento is half unmetered? Unmetered? You can't manage what you don't measure. And in other places, it's decreasing water rates. The more you use, the less you pay for water. No, no, no. It has to be just the opposite way around. So let's start by recognizing a human right to water. That's modest quantities. Turns out that's only 1% of the water. Then we can have an adult conversation about how to price the other 99%. Now, this is, this is politically dicey. I get that. And whenever I'm on the stage with an elected official and I start talking about raising the price of water, the elected official's eyes go open and he's looking for the chief of staff. Who put me on the, on the dais with this character? This is the biggest mistake in my political... I don't care about that. And the reason I don't care is because I have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> to be serious, don't expect your elect elected officials to get out in front on this one. But it's, I couldn't be more serious about the need to do this. As I go around and speak to groups, I meet talented people, inventors, engineers, who have built better water mouse traps, things that actually work. And what is so sad is that almost to a person, none of them has a viable business plan because the price of water is too low. We've got to do better. Third, we're enter entering into a, a, an era of water reallocation. Oh, I, I got to, almost skipped over this slide. So, What's been happening, instead of raising the price of water, three years ago, or two years ago, Texas, and this coming in and out, can you mostly hear me? Mostly is enough, probably. Um, every other word. 
so, so what's happening in California is they've ordered people to conserve, and they have, and then that means that there's not enough revenue coming in because there's not enough water going out the door. That means that the utility has to raise water rates. Oh, that's, that's called term limits. You, know? you, you ask people to do what you know, was good, they do what's good, and you say, here's the bill. You know? If they had just raised the rates to begin with and had an adult conversation about how this plays out and had promised to use the money only for water, the community would buy in. Got to do it. OK, third, reallocation of water. This is a photograph of, of a steel company in Utah, Geneva Steel. My message here is plain and simple. All the water that we have is there. And some of it is used for very low value. And I would like to see a market system of volunteer sale, buys, uh, sales, leases, options, whatever, between willing buyers and sellers. So this Geneva Steel case uh, or situation was one where it was a plant actually built by the US government during the Second World War. After the war, they spun it off to US Steel. US Steel ran it for the better part of the 20th century. At the end of the 20th century, uh, however, the steel industry in the States was on the ropes. Uh, gosh, Pittsburgh had 100-year-old blast furnaces. Uh, Detroit was making automobiles that American consumers didn't want. The Chinese steel industry was young and aggressive, modern equipment, taking market share. So Geneva Steel tried to cut costs, didn't work. Had to go into bankruptcy, tried to reorganize, didn't work. Finally, they just had to go out of business, liquidate all of their assets. But they had substantial assets to liquidate. First, they had the land itself. And this is just outside of Provo, Utah, where Brigham Young University is. It's really prime land on the greater Wasatch Front, just south of Salt Lake City. So that brought in 46 million. They had uh, the mill itself with all the blast furnaces. That brought in 40. They had an iron ore mine. That brought in 10. Pollution reduction credits brought in four. All told, they netted $100 million. Then they sold the water for 102. The water was worth more than all of these other very substantial assets combined. This is the future of water in the United States, as it should be. What happened in Utah was that the state engineer said, not playing that game anymore, charades where I give you a permit to drill a well knowing that the water table is already dropping, where I give you a permit to take water out of a river knowing that the river is overappropriated and the fish are getting hammered. No, no. It's not no growth, but it is a demand offset system. It's saying to a developer, if you want to grow, you've got to bring water to the table. And this is what happened. This was purchased on behalf of municipalities who turned around and peddled it to the developers. Every penny of this is paid for by the development community to offset growth, as it should be. Well, that's a nice story. But really, the water's being used by farmers. That's where the water is. So if you're going to reallocate water, it's going to come from farming. So let me just finish up on that. So the, 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 the disparities in the use of water the value produced by it are immense, and they provide what economists, economists would call the right setting for trading to occur. If something is worth a lot more to someone else, then you're willing to trade. Well, this, this shows it in spades. An acre foot used to grow alfalfa, about 900 bucks. Lettuce in Yuma, the iceberg capital of the country in, in the winter months, about 6,000. But in Silicon Valley, by Intel, $13 million. So you can understand that farmers might feel that that bullseye is indeed a target on their water. The cities want some of their water. And I've been going around uh, this year talking with some farmers and, and irrigation people and the like. And I've put this slide up because I think I know the answer to, the slide, to this. Are farmers going to use more, about the same, or less? But in the three groups I talked talk to, maybe four or 500 people in all, not one person thought farmers were going to use more water, and only a handful about the same. Now, um, predictions are difficult, Yogi Berra once said. 
Um, he was absolutely right, no doubt about that. That was absolutely right, Yogi. Um, so here's what I'm thinking must happen. We have to ensure, if there is to be water trading, that the end of this process is that we have preserved the integrity and strength of rural, rural communities, rural agricultural communities. We must do that. We must do it because it's right, and we must do it because if we don't do it, the trade's not going to occur. But the opportunity for trade, the value added to the municipal and industrial sectors is so great that they can afford to pay handsomely for this water as they should. And so what I think what we end up doing is we put in place a process for the municipal and industrial interests to pay to modernize farm infrastructure, farm irrigation systems. More than half of all the water used in California today is is dispersed by flood irrigation. It is the most wasteful form of irrigation. So we need to do better. And we can keep farmers in business and free up a little bit of water for the non-farm community. One of the companies that I am most impressed with is an Israeli company. They've actually been in business since 1966, 50 years next year. Netafin, drip irrigation. And uh, I was with them at an alfalfa conference. I visited some of their facilities. I've drunk the Kool-Aid, ladies and gentlemen. It's quite amazing. You can get higher quantities. You can get higher quality. You're putting the water exactly where it's needed. You can add fertilizer and nutrients to the fertilized water. I mean, it's just really stunning. Does it have challenges? Yes. But the big resistance is this. It costs $2,500 or $3,000 an acre to put it in. That's a lot of money for our country. And if you think about that, you realize we need to figure out some way to finance it. Well, that's where the cities come in. The cities, they would gladly pay 2,500 or 3,000 bucks an acre to get a little bit of, of the water. And the other thing that I'm very passionate about is what I'm calling the summertime suspension of irrigation. You may hear this described as deficit irrigation. Deficit irrigation actually comes out of the wine business, where if vintners found if you gave the grapes a little less water than they would like, you get a better wine. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this entire summer in Imperial Valley, in Coachella Valley, in Palo Verde, in Yuma, there have been uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of alfalfa grown when the temperature was 110, 115 degrees. And you know what? That uses four times as much water as other cuttings in the year and produces alfalfa with a lower quality and a lower quantity. The farmers get next to nothing for it. But they don't have any incentive to sell or lease it. They don't have the option to do that. So in this recent report for Bookings, um, I and my two co-authors, a lawyer and economist, argue for removing some of these impediments. Let farmers benefit from, from, from doing deals. And if they did, the first water they would take out would be that summertime, summertime water. So I think we, we have the opportunity with drip irrigation and with summertime suspension of really freeing up a lot of water. And finally, it shouldn't be very threatened. We can help the farmers. What amazes me is that Silicon Valley, despite the fact that they need water for all of their server farms, doesn't even seem to know that the Central Valley exists. And it's starting to change. You're starting to see companies producing apps, uh, more ways to give farmers increased information. You're starting to see drones be used in farm fields so they can look, what, look at what's going on in the middle of a field, previously inaccessible. All of this, I think, is, is, is quite, quite exciting. Now, this doesn't mean that farmers aren't scared. They are scared, and I don't blame them. But I ask you to think about these six factors. What would cause farmers to use less water? It won't be the first one, commodity prices. Oh no, not when we're going from seven billion to nine billion. If anything, if what you're seeing is a lot of the smart money, the big international money, all going into farmland. Bond yields are low. There's no return on, on capital. Put it in land. And you're seeing, I am sure, all around Illinois, uh, ag land has jumped in, in value last, last few years. It's, it's exactly that. So commodity prices are certainly not going down. The real threat is number two. All around the country you're seeing high quality ag land go out of production. At least under my system with buying and selling water rights, when a farmer 
does a deal, the farmer looks around and says, well, you know, that land out by the barn, it's all clay soil. Now, I'm not yielding very many bushels per acre. But when you convert ag land into solar energy or into municipal subdivisions, that land's gone forever. And that land is indifferent to whether it's high quality ag land or low quality ag land. Right now, as we sit here this evening, in the Sacramento area, there are plans for developers to build 280,000 homes. Do you have any idea how much great ag land is going to be lost when that happens? That's the big threat I see going forward. The other things I put up just simply to scare farmers. If you don't, if you don't want to do deals, then do you want to leave it to the legislature? I didn't think so. You want to leave it to the courts? I didn't think so. You want to leave it to administrators? I didn't think so. So put that way, it's really not as frightening as some people think. And then finally, finally, it doesn't take a lot of ag water to solve the municipal and industrial problem. A 4% reduction in ag consumption translates into almost a 50% increase in the water available for municipal and industrial use. So it's a low single digit reduction paid for by having the farmers become more efficient thanks to the money put forward by the municipal and industrial sector. That way, we protect the farmers, farm communities remain robust, farmers grow the same amount of product, but with a little less water, and the cities get the water saved. So at the end of the day, I'm optimistic. Is it a tough time? You bet. It's a crisis, no doubt. But a crisis is a time of opportunity. It's a time when we still get to select between one path and another and a combination of things, some conservation, some reuse, some, some desal, some price signals, got to use price signals, a little bit of sales and leases with, uh, with market forces, all of those things together can, can, can keep us from going over the cliff, can keep the crisis from becoming a catastrophe. Now what we need, what we really need, and anything else, is the moral courage and the political will to act. Thanks. You can use my microphone. <laughs> well, that was, that was the idea. So. <laughs> yeah, sure can. Okay. And I'll repeat it if they can. Water and for the water, it's oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I just started echoing. Um, recognizing the importance of water and charging for the the water commodity itself, ended up finding themselves with all new political challenges. Yeah. Whether it's the municipality itself recognizing their utility is now a cash cow and trying to take advantage of that, or um, uh, turf wars between water rights. How does the whole political struggle fit into? to what you're talking about with reform, and how do you get around some of those human nature political issues yeah, associated it's a, it's with a, It's a great issue. Uh, so just a little quick thing on water um, providers. In the municipal sector, there are two sorts. Most water, about 85% of water comes from a municipal water department run by the, by the city or the town. So it's controlled by the mayor and council. About 15% of municipal water is provided by a private water company regulated by the State Public Utility Commission. And both have their unique sets of, of challenges. Um, the, the tradition has been in the United States to think that water should be as cheap as possible. It should be like air. But water, in fact, is very pricey. The infrastructure for water is costly. And the infrastructure in the United States is in a terrible state of disrepair. 
Will there be challenges in putting real money on the table to do this? Yes. No one wants to run for office saying, I overhauled the sewer system. No, that's just not the way it plays out. But I would, I would flip it around and say this. Listen, the United States has a strong and proud tradition of water for all, and it's been cheap. And the longer we let this deteriorate, the more wealthy people are going to opt out of the system. You're going to see them putting in their own wells, buying reverse osmosis systems for home use, not giving a darn about the public supply. And we will have lost something very essential to who we are as a people if we let that happen. So I think uh, there are solutions. One of the solutions is you can't have them ripping off the water for other cash cow things. If you're raising the water rate, it has to be used for, for water. I think, I think citizens get that intuitively. You know, if this is to provide me a long-term future and my children, uh, I'm willing to sign, sign on. Good, good question. Sir? I think it's not on. Or you can go use hers. Just, oh, good. There we go. It's a very interesting presentation. I wanted to uh, ask you a question in regards to your discussion about uh, conservation. And what struck me is <clears throat> in the electrical utility industry, they had the same issues, but then they did decoupling yeah. so that it no longer, your revenue was no longer tied to how many electrons you sold. Yes. So the question is, what's your thoughts? Do you see that happening when it comes to water utilities? What do you think is the probability of that happening, and what do you think can be done to kind of to, to make that happen faster? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So decoupling, you may know, in the utility, in the electric utility in, uh, setting, worked like this. If you are an electric utility and you come in uh, asking the Public Utility Commission to put up a new generating plant, they might say to you, well, if you can figure out a way to reduce demand, we will compensate you for doing that. So they end up putting in place <coughs> conservation programs that save water, that avoid having to build the power plant, thereby saving consumers money, but then the utility gets some money for having put these programs in place. And there have been some effort to do that in the water world, a couple of communities in California. I think it's been with, with mixed success. Uh, the pushback I'm hearing mostly in the utility space, well, a couple of things, in the utility space is this. Um, we have to have some fixed charges for the uh, pipes that we have in place. We can't simply have charges for consumption alone because, as you see, when consumption goes down, the utility suddenly doesn't have enough money. So there's some pushback by utilities in order to avoid the conservation death spiral that everyone has to pay a little bit of a fixed rate. The second thing is public utility commissions are having a very difficult time dealing with what I would call innovative forms of water. And it, I'll be around for the next two days, and we can, those of you interested in this, we can explore it in some detail. But uh, there's a case out of New York where the utility wanted to build a desalinization plant. The Public Utility, utility Commission told them to do that, changed their minds five years later after the company had spent $50 million, and has yet to let the company recoup the $50 million that it told to spend. Well, this is madness, because it sends exactly the wrong signal to the utility never propose to do an expensive system. Go, go to Home Depot and buy two cases of duct tape. You know, that's going to be our solution. So we can talk more uh, at another, another time. A couple more questions? A couple, couple more. I'm keeping you from drinks, you know, when I realize that this is the worst place to be. Last speaker and the bar is open, so. Um, you talked a little bit about farmers and ethanol versus alfalfa production, and here in Illinois, the land of corn and soybeans, which are mostly grown for feed, um, for large animals, livestock, for meat and dairy, I wanted to know your thoughts on how we could fix that demand problem, because such large animals demand so much food yeah. per day, so much more than us. So. 
land conversion or anything that you wanted to? Yes. Boy, that's, that's a great question and a real, real ticklish one. It's, it's uh, I think, implicit in, in your comment, Ms., was, uh, you know, if you look globally, what's happening is, as, uh, as you have a large rising middle class in China, India, and a few of the other emerging nations, you're seeing diets change, and it's increasingly more meat, you know, more protein-based, and the protein, the water footprint of growing, growing uh, beef in particular is really quite, quite substantial. I personally distinguish, and, and it gets into ethical issues about animals and about the planet. Um, I, when I think of alfalfa, I do distinguish between dairy and beef I mean, for steaks versus dairy because the criticism of alfalfa has been it's really not food, it's just feed for something else. But in the case of dairy, gosh, you feed Bessie a little hay in the morning and you milk her in the afternoon. That's about as direct a production of, of food as, you, as I can imagine. So I, I kind of see those as two different, different things. But it's, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, I think wholly apart from the philosophical and ethical issues, uh, the market's going to take care of some of that. Because the price of, of beef, you've already seen it starting to go up, and it's going to continue to go up quite a bit as, uh, as the cost associated with it <coughs> continue. Sure. No, no, I'm, I'll, I'll be around all night and the next two days. I leave Wednesday afternoon. So. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like your example of water alloca reallocation. Yes. Uh, that shows water is more expensive than anything else. Uh, and then you come to another slide. You, you talk about how to make farmers to use that water. And yes. that's very necessary in many places around the world because yes. farmers are using a large amount of water. Um, so that also probably is necessary for water, realloc water reallocation, I mean, to shift the water from, from farmers to other people. Uh, and then I'm so interested in your multi-choice problem. Uh, among this choice, you list government and the regulation roles. You also put market. And your example with the steel plant, that went through with market. What is your opinion about the role of government roles yes. versus the market in the future right. in this country and in other, many other countries? Yeah, another great question. Uh, and I'll try to be brief, and then, sir, maybe we can talk over the break or, or tomorrow. Well, I, I don't think it's an either or. I mean, I think it's both. Uh, you know, sometimes I get pushed back on, on people on the property rights crowd and say, well, it's my right to drill a well and pump as much water as I want from beneath my land. But my response to that is, well, every first year law student learns that property is a series of characteristics, or the, the adage is a bundle of sticks. One of the sticks is exclusivity. It's my property, not your property. So if you come on it, I can tell you to go away or have you arrested for trespass. But in the situation of drilling wells, the right that people want is the right to drill a well and pump which will work only unless and, and until a commercial pumper comes in and puts in a well across the street that's deeper and more powerful than yours, and suddenly your well goes dry. Well, that's not a property right. That's just mutually assured destruction. So uh, I think that there's a role for government in creating the framework for markets. I mean, it's not a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. A market depends on property rights. Property rights are created and protected by the government. That said, you can have more or less regulation. But I think there's a powerful role for markets, but there's also a powerful role for regulation. This is longer than I intended to be, but, but bear with me. About one more minute. If you look at the USGS reports from the 2010, which is the most recent five-year history, right, you're seeing great trends on virtually every user group. The big declines are in power production and in, in, in industry. Okay? You know what's driving that? Government rules and regulations. It's called the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And whether you're Duke Energy or Intel, you want to save money and, uh, by complying with the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. So it's really government rules and regulations not directly saying use less water, but, but don't pollute the environment, have had a powerful role in shaping how it would perform. And then, of course, you see 
the markets respond. So if you can start to sell pollution credits, you know, then you'll use less if you can make some money by selling it. Well, I'm offering the same kind of thing for farmers. If you've been using 100 and now you only use 90, you should be able to do something where you benefit by letting someone else use the 10. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for hosting me. Thank you.